I, I think we're going to get started. I may get Jerry off the phone. He's, he's, he's buying another soccer club as we speak. Closed. <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome back in. Uh, as a sponsor, I guess I get the top panel here today, and it's, it's my pleasure to welcome Jerry Cardinal, founder of Redbird Capital, Ian Charles, co-founder of Arctos, and uh, Badad Egabali, co-founder of Clear Lake Capital. And I thought maybe we'd use just one microphone, but I didn't want to see anybody wrestling with Ian over the next 20 minutes. And so to keep everyone safe and all limbs attached, I think we've got four here now. Um, I know this is going to be a lively panel, and I'm hoping this is the last you guys will hear of me, because um, I want to hear you guys debate some, some stuff. Um, so when it comes to, to U.S. investment, uh, I know all three of you guys are primarily drawn to uh, the big four U.S. leagues that currently permit private equity investment in this country. So that would be MLS, the NBA, the NHL, and Major League Baseball. Uh, but in Europe, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, it's been open uh, to private equity and institutional investment uh, forever. And there seems to be a lot of opportunities. So whether you're buying AC Milan, AC Milan like uh, Jerry recently did, or um, Chelsea uh, with Bedad, uh, or investing across Europe like Ian, uh, or even Wrexham like Ryan Reynolds, uh, there's a lot to look at. So let me, let me throw out to the group, uh, whoever wants to pick this one up, how do you curate all the opportunities that are coming your way, and what are you primarily focused on when you're looking at a European investment? Our, our, our perspective our perspective is, is a little bit different. What we're, what we're pitching our institutional clients is that we can give them diversified exposure to some of the best brands in the world, but predominantly in North American sporting assets. We think those assets are a little bit different. They're a little bit more durable, a little bit more resilient. The, the league architecture's uh, a little bit different. So when we do go uh, and invest internationally, we're looking for assets that have the same kind of profile of a North American sports franchise, and, and that's harder to find internationally. When you do find it, um, we're, we're interested. But that's the filter that we use. We're trying to build a portfolio of these very durable brands in really important markets with great owners. We tend to focus on North America, but when we can find those attributes overseas, um, then, then we're interested in partnering. But that's, but that's our approach. Yeah, look, I'd say uh, for us, the stuff we've done in Europe takes different uh, incarnations, sort of derivatively Liverpool through Fenway Sports Group, Toulouse, um, which was its own, you know, sort of experiment that we, that we did very successfully, and then now AC Milan. But they all carry the same attributes where we can, um, you know, buy relatively well, but then really own well. And that either comes from buying into an existing team and ownership group like Fenway that I think it's one of the best out there, uh, and then bring what we can bring to take that to the next level in partnership with them. Toulouse, which got relegated, and then, you know, within, after the first year, we got to promote it again and doing the kind of things that we can do for a team like that. And then AC Milan, which, you know, I think AC Milan, and I've been on the record on this, like, I think AC Milan is a really interesting sort of hybrid in between those two where, you, you know, that really should be a sleeping giant that we can really bring some value to both on the field and off the field. And, you know, being able to do both of those things is really important to us. Um, you know, the challenge for guys from this side of the pond working over there is that you, I think you got to embrace the fact that, you know, buying into European football is a public-private partnership. And that's different than investing in teams over here. So you, you, have, you have to factor that component into it. And, you know, we're, we're still figuring that out, but we embrace that wholeheartedly, and, and that can be part of the upside if you do it right. Yeah, no, for us, it was about really looking at the macro, right? You look at, you know, the NFL, the NBA, NFL, 20 or so billion revenue, 150, 200 million fan base, um, media rights, all rights, all IP is really shared within the league, whereas European soccer, you have a massive, massive English Premier League, you know, massive global audience, you share broadcast revenue, but kind of big disparity otherwise in terms of your IP, your assets. Um, 
we'll talk about it, but, uh, you know, we thought Chelsea was a good, you know, beachhead, Londa, and it was, a, frankly, an asset, a, a business that, in our view, was not terribly well managed on the football side, on the soccer side, sporting side, or the commercial side, so meaningful opportunity kind of at the club, and we'll get to it. For us, needed the beachhead to then look at multi-clubs, and obviously Blitz and Ian and others have, and, and Jerry have done other clubs without the beachhead first, but for us, we wanted to start with Chelsea, and we'll, I'm sure you'll ask us about multi-club and how do you how do you piece all these together. I think hopefully there's at least a theory that there's a there's a business plan to do so. So let's let's before we get into the multi-club model, which I do want to which I do want to talk about, and I think folks would like to hear about. Let's let's talk a little bit about the team itself as an asset. So you, you've got the team, you've got what happens on the pitch. But I've heard Jerry describe these assets, which used to be owned by, you know, primarily high net worth individuals or families, as mini Disney's. And Ian, I've I've, I've heard you interviewed and uh, debated with with Doc actually, you know, whether these are platform investments or not. And if so, what's the key component of the platform? Um, but Dad, you're referring to Chelsea as as a beachhead, both for growing the portfolio of assets, but really for um, helping to commercialize that asset. Can, can one of you guys pick up on this idea of Disney or a platform or a beachhead and what you guys are hoping to achieve there? Well, it could be Disney. It could be, you know, sports is religion. It could be, you know, not to pick on the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church, right? These are institutions that have a wide generational following that thanks to technology and, you know, you know really streaming and, digital rights are were in the early, early innings, early days of really global audiences of, of the live content. And, you know, I think to Jerry's point, they are to some degree more public private partnerships, but like anything, you gotta put a good product on the field. You gotta win. Your content is your your asset is 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 the play. And I think the the opportunity to, you know, make it a platform is very much there. And again, I think to to the to Ian's point, you know, and Jerry's point earlier, these things generally are not well managed in our view. They, they're not optimized, frankly, some of the U.S. ownership, Fenway Group with, uh, with, uh, our, you know, with uh, Liverpool or, or, you know, Abu Dhabi and Mubadala and with Man City have done it well. But for the most part, these things haven't been optimized. Uh, again, we looked at it and we think, European sports is probably 20 years behind U.S. Uh, U.S. sports in terms of sophistication on the commercial side, sophistication on the data side. I had one super high-level sporting director at the world's biggest top three club tell me when I asked about their approach to data, and he said, the data's my eyes. I, I pick players on my eyes. He has six scouts, no data. Again, using some of the, at least some of the data points we know of the good good sports teams in any league here, there's 10, 20, 30 data analysts, and, and there's wide use of data. So, you know, that's one analogy, one place where we think there's a lot of headway, a lot of runway, sorry, in terms of European sports, and which, by the way, have a global audience, have, have a global opportunity. I think 90 to 95 percent, depending on the team, of the top teams in, the, in, in England, the fan bases are outside, the, outside of the UK and England. So. These are global assets, global audiences, um, which we think, you know, we, we can certainly help grow. Yeah, look, I, I mean, <clears throat> my, my point on the Disney analogy is really aspirationally what these should be, right? And to Badad's point, you know, they, they are under-optimized. But, you know, one of the challenges for sports globally is I don't think anyone, incumbents or new entrants, have figured out how to monetize the live event. And it's actually really hard to monetize the live event, right? It's hard to scale it. Um, one of the reasons you look at, you know, multi-club, you know, platforms is obviously there's the benefits and the synergies on the player side, but there's also if you do it right and you create the right infrastructure, you can amortize that across multiple different, you know, IP platforms, if you will. At the end of the day, it's just intellectual property monetization. And so, I don't, I don't, I don't get emotionally attached to you know, the, from, as a fan of these things, I try not to get emotionally attached. I look at them and I say, you know, these, you know, one of the things that all of us should take note of is, you know, this concept that these things are bought on a multiple of revenue is a joke, right? I mean, that's a shame. Why is that, right? You're a cash flow guy. I know that, right? You guys are, 
And so they should be cash flow properties. Well, you know, there's a whole list, there's a virtual circle there where, you know, you've got to, at the end of the day, in Europe, the public-private partnership demands that you deliver for your public partner, which is the fans, and all they care about is winning. That model, with no salary cap and relegation in the transfer market, has led to a phenomenon where everyone's deficit financing this and is an arms race for players. Well, that, that sort of divergent encounter to cash flow generation, I think there should be, I think we can accomplish both, and I think there can be a new form of ownership that monetizes intellectual property in the form of a Disney-type mentality where you've got the 360-degree flywheel of monetizing that hub and spoke and holistic, and that cash flow generation, if you do it right, can go back into a very smart way of putting a value proposition on the field. We think of North American assets as, as having three pieces. Every North American sports team, and this is fairly unique, owns a piece of their league. The, the content, the intellectual property, the brands, the assets that are built and owned at the league level, whether you're in Memphis or New York City, you own the same piece of the league. So that's, that's part number one. Part number two is, is North American sports is one of the only ways you can get a legal monopoly in the United States. There are only three industries in this country that have grown revenues at least 6% for 25 years in a row, and all of them have monopolistic pricing power. Education, healthcare, and sports. And getting that local, legal, live entertainment monopoly in one of the 30 most important markets in North America, that's a really, really powerful asset. And then if you're lucky, you can partner with an owner that wants to use that monopolistic pricing power to build a platform maybe through real estate, maybe through media. If you're lucky, I mean, we partners with, with one of the best groups in, in the world at this in Fenway Sports Group. It's real estate, it's media, it's multiple franchises, it's multiple markets, multiple countries, and then there is this flywheel effect um, around talent, around content, and around the calendar. Uh, and so that's what we look for when we talk about like the three assets that you get in North America. That's, that's what we're talking about. But how do you look differently when you're looking at Europe? So we don't have collective bargaining in Europe. Um, we do have a fixed number of teams, thankfully, so we still have uh, scarcity value. Um, they don't all share in a lot of league revenues. And you have fan bases that, you know, as passionate as U.S. fans may be, um, it, many of them pale in comparison to some of the European clubs. So how do you, how do you look at that, and how do, you, how do you account for those risks Listen, I think uh, it's also an asset not to share, you know, your revenues if you're in New York City with Memphis, right? So mm -hmm. New York City is going to have more revenues. Uh, London, you know, I think what we have in, uh, you know, kind of in the portfolio is London. I, I think, uh, you know, outside there's tremendous amount of ways we can monetize the media asset, to, to Jerry's point, that hasn't been done yet. You know, mobile and approach to mobile, again, is, is 1999 in terms of, you know, in terms of, we think most of the clubs out there, again, Fenway, which, uh, you know, does it well, is very profitable, nicely profitable. Uh, you know, they, they don't, it's worked. So we think, we think there's a lot to do around, you know, gate, around to do around media, uh, live content, stories, right? We have content from players in the academy, Chelsea Academy, along with Barcelona, probably the two best in Europe. We have videos, content from some of the stars starting age six, seven, eight monetizing some of that content into into the 30 for 30 or, or you know, a lot of the content, a lot of the stories, right? We think we, we'd, you know, li like to have that as opposed to shared with the leagues. I think to Jerry's point, the, the question is, how do you run these things more effectively? How do you control salary costs? I think there's a global pool of talent. I think for the multi-club, back to, back to that, comes into play is if you have, you have clubs that, that can be pathways, development pathways for players where you're, you're managing your content, your, your you know, labor costs effect much more effectively, where you're not buying the 30-year-old the free agent, right? You're, you're signing players, you keep, keep the players, you keep re-upping players. Uh, you're not subject to arbitration. I, I think, you know, we, we think there's certainly a path to, to manage labor costs and, and frankly, still, still produce a winning product using data, using the multi-club. We think the multi-club, by the way, is a, 
quite an interesting tool for player trading, right? I think, uh, you know, I think the ones we've looked at successfully generate on a payroll of 20 million Red Bull Group, who does it well, we think, too, 15, 20 million, 25, maybe 40 million payroll for their uh, largest club, they generate 50 to 100 million yearly in profit in, in player, player trading and player sales. So again, I think you bring in a data overlay and, and kind of a cohesive global structure, I think player pathways, teams that are better run in, in second tier markets that you're buying at revenue multiples and revenue multiples matter in so far as if you can structurally make money. But, you know, we look at some of the U.S. sports, you know, leagues and teams and, and frankly, NFL, NBA, NFL is profitable, but there's revenue multiples, five, six, seven, eight, ten. I think Jerry and Ian have been buying teams at one, two, three, four times revenue multiples. And if you have a cost structure that can sustain and you you kind of, you know, kind of invigorate the, the fan base that, you know, we think you can have businesses that make money that are in some ways natural monopolies in their markets without the regulation, without the without the salary caps or, you know, you know, frankly, minimum salary caps are what you got to spend if you're a small market team. So we think early days. And again, I think you look at the track record of folks who've invested. There's certainly folks who've lost money, but for every one or two bad investors, at least the, the well-run clubs, uh, you know, they've been they've done a lot of good success stories. And I think, you know, again, I think we, we we feel like we're embarking on one, but a lot of work to do to accomplish it. Yeah, look, I'd say each of these markets geographically in Europe are their own ecosystems, and um, you know, I, I think guys like us can do our job in those ecosystems specific to the parameters of those ecosystems. Um, re regardless of whether it's England or the continent, as, as an example. Having said that, you know one of the things that I'm increasingly interested in is this this growing divergence between the English Premier League and the rest of the leagues on the continent. And um, you know, and, and you know, over there, it's it's you know, in the old days over here, everyone talked about media, and media was the silver bullet that was going to drive value for all of these teams. And and the world over here, I think we've the business is just, uh, you know, it's the pay, the business is the pace. Car. The business over here in sports is the pace car for the rest of the world, and so it's advanced way beyond just that facile notion that media is going to be your silver bullet to buy down your overpayment getting one of these teams. Over there, it's still really media, and media, you know, they haven't figured out how to monetize the live event. Um, you know, a lot of the infrastructure needs to be redeveloped. You know, all the stuff that we take for granted over here gives you a pathway to work your way into the money on an overbuy or a full value payment in, in being a, becoming a rights holder. But I, I, the thing that interests me as someone who just put a lot of money into Serie A uh, with AC Milan is that disparity, which is really driven by media. It's a three to one disparity between the English Premier League and Serie A, right? And it's two to one between La Liga and Serie A. Why is that? Right, and you know, and and you know, it's you and I were talking about that in the games that we had together, and and it's um, that there's a huge opportunity there, and I think, by the way, there's also a huge opportunity. I, I for, as as a relatively new entrant to European football, I for the life of me can't understand how you can have the world's most popular sport and not have the world's biggest economy in that sport in the global system. So this MLS thing. You know, come on. I mean, we we should be figuring out how to get the Americans into the world system, but you're not going to do that. The, the guys that are in the world system, they don't want someone like America coming into that. So, there, when you start looking at these kind of major structural changes that guys like us could be positive catalysts for, and as responsible participants, that's really interesting to me. You know, at some point, you run out of things to do here, right? So maybe one of the things you know we can set our eyes on. I think. I think it's safe to say we could, you know, each one of us can probably do our job in a specific asset. What's really interesting is if we can, as we're doing our job in a specific asset, can we be catalysts for that kind of structural change at that level, which is really very Darwinian and it's what needs to happen. One, one interesting data point, right? So cumulative market cap, use Forbes value of, uh, of NFL teams, probably 150 billion, 155 billion. Add the Premier League, La Liga, uh, France, Italy, you know, Syria, I think you're 30 billion, 35 billion fan bases of fan bases of maybe three, four billion globally compared to 200 million. Uh, and that's being generous to the NFL of, of a fan. So it's talk about a 
league and a sport that's optimized, clearly you're, you're not every sub's created equal, but four billion, four billion fan base on, on a cumulative market gap of, of 30 billion maybe, uh, maybe a little more, but zip code and cumulative media revenue, Jerry, of five, six billion maybe against 20 for the NFL. Right. on 20 times the fan base globally. Right. Tremendous upside. Tremendous. Well, but you got it, but you, a tremendous upside, but you know, you yeah. can't, you, you, you have to be, you know, you, you can't just buy into a league and let, and just sit there. I mean, the challenge is, you know, to do this kind of stuff, you, you gotta, you gotta shake it up a bit. But you, but I'm telling you, over there, you got to be responsible about how you do that. We cannot go in guns blazing as Americans, you know, just applying the same mentality over there. It's different. And so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm watching that and trying to figure out, you know, how we do that. But there is no doubt that that would be a very positive contribution that we can make to that ecosystem in a responsible way. So Americans have gone in gun blazing and learned their lessons, I think, in England, certainly in Italy. And you chose to invest in Italy, even recognizing the disparity uh, between the Premier League and Syria. I assume you're viewing that primarily as a lot, a lot of work, but a lot of upside if you do it right. Yeah, as I said, look, it, it, within each of these ecosystems, we're in the English Premier League, we're in League, league One, we're in Syria. They're all, at a macro level, it's the same things. We bring, it's the same ingredients, the same parameters. We kind of know how to do it. But then, you know, there are nuances specific to each of those. Syria, look, I mean, just take the fact that we didn't underwrite this in, in our underwriting case, but there hasn't been a new stadium in Italy since 2011. Right, and that was a forty thousand seat stadium, in turn, right. And so, you know, when, if you're if you're Michael Rapino, uh, and you want to go take the, these global acts to Europe, and you could look at Italy, you really don't have anywhere to go. Um, now, you know, as as I think we've seen, you know, there's a great partnership between music and sports, right. And again, it comes back to if you look at these things, going back to the analogy of my point about mini Disney's, you know, these are these are live event entertainment companies. Right, and so yes, we have a job to do, we, which is to put a value, pro a, to provide a value proposition to the fans who are our implicit partners in these markets. Which means we got to win. One of the things I've learned over here in in the states, being affiliated and involved with the Yankees and the Red Sox and the other teams, things that we've done is, you know, everyone thinks you have to win a World Series or a Super Bowl every year, right? And I don't think that's the case. I think the value proposition. I mean, that's the beauty of sports. That's why sports attracts what it attracts because. You're not necessarily, I mean, the Dodgers are out right now, right? I mean, who, right, 111 win season. That's the beauty of sports. What you have to do is put a compelling product on the field consistently every year, right? So, you know, with the Serie A opportunity, with the AC Milan opportunity, they won the Scudetto last year. You know, the expectation is we got to do our job to make sure they win it again. But then there's Champions League, and then there's, you know, narrowing the gap between Serie A and the EPL. So there's so many different levels. And then that's before you even get to the infrastructure and bringing a new stadium to Italy, et cetera. How do you guys model for promotion and relegation? You're evaluating a, a property and it shouldn't trade on revenues, you said, Badad. How do you account for, you know, what, what we uh, folks who are representing folks in private equity or in private equity always consider the zero-sum game? Um, how, how do you factor that into your investment thesis? <laughs> so, listen, I think, again, at, at, at the... At the Chelsea or AC Milan level, these are the premium teams for the premium payrolls in, in respective leagues. I think that's less of an issue. I think what relegation means for Chelsea is, frankly, a league that has three partners leaving and three entering years. So in terms of alignment to grow the pie, alignment to distribute, redistribute the pie, you know, et cetera, is, is not exactly what the U.S. sports leagues and teams, the, the fraternity that exists uh, and, and the league, I would say, league-wide thoughtful management that exists in most U.S. leagues doesn't there. It's, it's more of a collective, you know, confederacy of teams that maybe work together, but not always. So for Chelsea, that's what it means. I think, frankly, for, for a astute U.S. investor, which there are a lot of there who've invested, I think it frankly means opportunity where you're stepping into a Division two or Division three team, you run it better, you 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 create the player pathways. You get it promoted, right? I think that that opportunity, that opportunity. And again, it's these are priced teams that are teetering on the edge of relegation, or teams that are 
second division appropriately are priced for it, right? So in that sense, in that sense, and again, I think story after story, uh, you know, I think Italy's more complicated and people, quote unquote, who've lost money, you know, but, but you know, I think you guys have a choice asset. I think in England, largely people have made, made done well and made money. I, th I think the places where people have made mistakes on relegation is just honestly in, in our, in our diligence has been inept management, complete inept management, um, you know, of, of the commercial and the sports side of it, right? And I think, uh, you know, I think if you're buying a division two or team teetering, I think you're getting paid for it, if you, especially if you can improve it. So your, your partner, uh, the dad, Todd Boley, spoke about building a multi-club model. And I'm curious what you guys are thinking. You're, all three of you are invested into multi-club models uh, in various asset classes. So um, tell us a bit more about your thoughts there and why you think there are some synergies in that, that approach. Yeah, I think three, three, uh, you know, three, different, three different reasons for it. I think one, if, if done well, you could make money on, on each specific Enterprise, I think what Jerry's done, Blitz, Ian, you guys have done, you bought well, you're gonna make money on this specific investment. Two, if done right, uh, if, if you use data, if you're thoughtful about this global market for talent and access to talent, that's not, not, you know, not effectively done through a draft, an NFL draft or an NBA draft or the extensive, extensive college uh, or, or baseball farm system, which I would attribute as a multi-club effectively model, you can actually, capture, acquire, retain, sign talent and monetize talent. So I think there's a, there's a talent, you know, arbitrage opportunity that exists. And three, for an AC Milan or Chelsea, it's the perfect pathway, right, of, of developing talent whereby you don't have to spend crazy money on payroll for, there's teams in the Premier League that, that spend 10% of what the top five, six teams spend on payroll uh, we, we hired a coach away from Brighton. We think they're one of the best run teams in the Premier League. Um, uh, you know, founder owner is a, is a sports gaming, you know, data, you know, background. He spends 10% of the payroll, wins almost as much, right? And is a very stable mid-market, mid-table, you know, pr very profitable club, right? So I think if you apply some of that IP into developing talent, but keeping your talent, again, not subject to arbitration, not subject to, certainly subject to free agency, but the model of six, seven, eight year contracts earlier based on players you've retained who have market value, we think can be a sustainable model. And uh, again, I think we were probably in the third inning of, of that of teams, leagues, all of us and others are looking at different markets, making bets in different markets. For us, you know, Portugal's an interesting market, obviously gateway to South America, um, gateway to, to you, know, you know, European visas. French market's interesting, given, given uh, you know, given quality of the league, given, frankly, quality of, of, of you know, uh, you know uh, French speakers in Africa, right? Africa, we think, is a big, big market. The Dodgers, you, you mentioned Todd, if they have an academy, they have a farm team in, in Uganda, right? So I think looking at Africa as a, as a market with you know just an untapped amount of talent close to Europe, time zone wise, close to Europe, we think is interesting. Um, and again, I think we're all kind of, we're all kind of teetering at the, we're the surface of where this is gonna go. Uh, clearly, I think our approach was, it, it so happened, so because of a global conflict, Chelsea was available and I think we, we thought you know, we'd start with that, but you know, I think what Ian, what you've done with Blitz is, is not start with the, the large market club and frankly build a nice network of clubs that have, that have cohesion and to have some symmetry. Where we've seen it not work is when people are buying clubs randomly, largely because it's there and it's for sale. And, and by the way, even those guys have made money on it, folks who've done that. Um, you know, but again, I think we're, we're in the early days of it. Uh, Jerry, what what have you what have you obviously you've had good investments across two three different markets di different places. What have you? What's your observation there? Well, like as as you do that, like the the people coming in just sort of targeted that aren't starting second third, just targeted. To, like I kind of feel like a lot of those guys are going to get smoked. <laughs> like it's been a good run, but like I mean, how? Look, I mean it's it's as I said I, the 
the approach is the same across all the assets. So there, there's an element where you, you, you know, if if you put the effort into a data analytics capability and a stadium, you know, renovation or infrastructure capability, and the marketing and the sponsor, you know, our our style has always been to up up to getting into rights, actual team ownership. You know, our style was always to partner with teams um, and leagues and build businesses with them where they contribute rights on a long-term basis. We contribute the capital and, and um, you know, the operating capability, and we build a yes or an on-location or a legends and things like that. You know, this that, that model we can do over here on a multi-club basis and cut out all the middlemen. I mean, I've always been of the view, and, and again, going back to the, these are great pieces of intellectual property, they should own the monetization of the intellectual property on a vertically integrated basis. Why are you outsourcing ownership of your customer, in this case the fans, to all these other things? We can we can create it ourselves. And that's that's what we've done in the past. And I think the multi-club thing is interesting because we can do that for multi-clubs. And oh, by the way, you get the strategic benefit that, you know, in terms of player development and and the things that you've talked about, you know, there's there's a synergy there where you can actually commingle player development into the things that, you know, you're doing on the field. So, you know, it's it, it's somewhat theoretical, but there, I think there really is an industrial logic to that kind of a collaboration and, and the commingling across management and across ownership and across player development. I think one thing to be mindful of there is really, you know, Champions League and kind of international or continental-wide competition. And I think, again, there's been solutions for that in terms of ownership levels, right? You know, we could partner and be a minority holder on a team, still get the benefit of, of some of the know-how, but really firewall off scouting and decision-making. And there's, there's, there's th thoughts to do that, in, in, including if you want to own the first team in multi leagues that all qualify for Champions League. So that is a, that's a barrier that, frankly, has been crossed a little bit by folks, but not fully crossed yet. And I think creating the right governance and right, frankly, walls will enable that. And you know, we think we think the individual club's stronger, right? Ultimately, if you go back to what Jerry said of the public-private partnership, if you're investing capital in a training facility in an academy, in a stadium, uh, if you're if you're improving the team, uh, you know, I think I think you're going to have a lot of public support for it. And I think there's a lot of untapped, you know, niche markets that are avidly, avidly supportive of the teams. There's teams in small cities in Europe that, you know, sell 40, 50,000 seats. These are two, 300, 400,000 person cities selling, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 seats, you know, for 40 matches. Pretty incredible. We can't fill at least some of our baseball stadiums. NFL does fine, but, but you know, I think there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of there there. And again, we, we just, we're attracted to the fact we don't think it's operated in Europe. It's the leagues and teams aren't operated nearly in the, in the same level of sophistication that the U.S. sports teams are. And again, notwithstanding some of the exceptions, like Fenway Group, um, most of the teams just are not operated, you know, efficiently and professionally. And uh, we think that's that itself presents a pretty good opportunity. Private equity comes <coughs> into investments, obviously looking to exit for a profit for uh, the fund investors. And you know, investing in teams you know, A, it's typically a longer term proposition, um, but B, you know, you're stewards for a community. You have an obligation that each of you guys has spoken about to your fan base and to putting a good quality product on the pitch. How do you guys, um, Badat or Jerry, how do you guys look at, look at exit strategies with respect to team ownership? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, look, look at AC Milan. I mean, you know, Elliot did a very good job in the four years that they were the, the control owner uh, and getting it to a point where they could hand the baton to us, I made the decision that I thought there was a <laughs> virtue and continuity and kind of kept them involved in some form. Um, so there, there's an ability to monetize and still stay involved. There's an ability, if you've subscribed to my cash flow notion, there's an ability to you know, re repatriate your your capital and, and, on, and, and get a return without necessarily selling it. Or you can, you know, given you know, the supply demand imbalance and the scarcity value around all of these assets, it's very easy to turn around and just sell it. Um, 
you know, you have a responsibility to, as you said, implicit in your question, you have a responsibility to, if you are going to do that and, and take it as a more traditional private equity play, you have a responsibility to make sure you hand it off in the right way, right? You got you to stay true to that. Um, but I don't really worry about exit because I know if we do our job, the exit will be there in some form. So I, I, don't, I don't invest really with, a, with a view towards thinking about how I'm going to get out. I, I think if we do our job, multiple opportunities will arise. And, and look, I think one of the things we're seeing and the reason why guys like us are getting involved in European football is there are no ownership restrictions. You know, it's very difficult for us to sort of play in, in the kind of ways that I like to play in the States as much. Over there, there's none of that restrictions, but that comes with other yeah, referring to debt restrictions and other other restrictions in the U.S. leagues. Yeah, I mean, you know, you really need to be a Desi billionaire to, to buy an NFL team. Um, you know, what's interesting about the the M and A market for sports teams in America is when you know I don't think any of those auctions that you've seen across these various leagues have really been that robust. There's a reason for that, right? It's the ownership rules, and that and that's you know and. That's okay. I mean, that's this. This is a very sophisticated, evolved market where that's okay. One of the things that's going to impose itself on this continued linear trajectory and these asset valuations in America is, I think, is that the Silicon Valley guys don't really, for the most part, don't really have a burning desire to own sports teams, right? You have pockets of it, but you know, if 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 all of Sil if if our version of the oligarchs really had an interest in owning these sports teams, I could say you could underwrite that continued linear trajectory. You don't have that, and then you have the ownership rules on top of it. Over in Europe, you know, it's very different. It's, it's much more egalitarian and it's a much more free market. But that comes with, you know, you, you take that and you take relegation in the transfer market and it's no wonder that you have the kind of ownership that, you know, that you've been seeing with sovereigns or with, you know, individuals that are immensely wealthy. Question now is can, you know, guys like us play in that pond and, and bring, a, bring our experience and a level of professionalization that enhances that whole ecosystem. That's, that's ultimately the macro play. So, so I would say, let me t start with your second question. So, so we think, you know, w you know, frankly, winning a good product on the field, on the pitch, and commercial success uh, go tie in, you know, hand in hand, right? You have to have a good product to generate the the, the sponsors, the, the content for the content to work, right? Michael Jordan, you know, the the ESPN special worked because Michael Jordan won, right? Ultimately, you know, uh, you know, yeah. Luke Longley didn't have a, you know, special during COVID, right? It's just the way it is. Um, so I'm, she's a great player, but but he didn't. So I think you got to win, right? And I think winning on the pitch, winning on the field just makes the, you know, you could do it efficiently, right, as opposed to not. But you have to do that to have commercial success, to have profitability. On the second question, so it's a great question, and it's a question we get. So we've we had clear, like, we've done about five what we call con continuation vehicles, uh, we call icon vehicles. So these are permanent, permanent vehicles, right, where LPs can choose to sell or choose to stay in. And th there's certainly a market, we think, for long duration ownership of specific assets where you're giving the LPs ultimately a choice to sell or to stay in. We've done about nine billion of it in the past 18 months. Um, sports, to you know, Jerry's point, has multiple, multiple, multiple folks, institutions, individuals who are interested, some of the largest pension funds in the U.S., actually the largest, asked us if they can co-invest, right? So the, 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 I would say the affinity element of sports, you know, and I guess everyone's got an opinion, so everyone has an opinion on all the above. I think it gets live in real kind of color followed. So we think there's a market for it. We think there's a market to afford LPs and ability to exit and other LPs the ability to step in and effectively have a long duration, nothing's permanent, but a long duration vehicle to keep these assets. And again, we've done it. We've done it with other assets. We think we think it's a, it, you know, there's certainly businesses, whether sports or others, you want to own for a long, long time. And I think private equity has to evolve from the, from the formation of, hey, I raised a fund, I got to sell, I got to raise next fund. I think we've done that too. But, but can we keep some assets, whether sport or other we want to keep a long time and enable people to come in and out. And I think, I think the market's evolving to that. And I think you're going to see more innovation from a lot of sponsors in doing that, you know, Ian and Jerry included with our funds. Taking the fifth, Ian? These guys did a great job on that. Okay, perfect. Any questions from, uh, from outside? I'm, I'm sure we've got a few. We've got about a minute 48.
hopefully that seems to be the case. So you want to you want to make sure that I can't go back to Italy. Thank that. you for thank <laughs> thank you for excluding me from that. <laughs> Look, I, 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 look. I think the point, Dave, is, is which you know, is is that that uh, there was a reason for that. Uh, the, the the structural imbalance of what I pointed out before between England and the continent is real, and and that needs to be addressed. Whether that's the right way to address it or not, I don't know. I could see something happening in the continent together, which I think could be theoretically interesting. But you know, this is a very contentious and hotly debated topic. I don't pretend to have any views on that. You know, I, my job is to keep my head down and, and, and not get involved in, in at that, that level of politics. But it's instructive to acknowledge the reasons why that happened and what are we gonna do about it. We can hit that in different ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be through that permutation. Yeah, I think the sport needs more high quality premium matches and content. I think it doesn't have to be a super league. I think, you know, again, Todd went there on an all-star game, right? I think baseball all-star game, talent competition, draft, generates two, three hundred million of revenue on a Monday, Tuesday here. None of that exists. Could you see a, you know, you know, EPL versus Syria all-star game? You know, could you see a preseason match that we do that just puts more premium content on the pitch? You know, I think you could. Um, structurally, are you gonna, given how botched that effort was to, Create something else. Are you gonna? Does anyone have any appetite for anything that sounds like that? I think you know a couple of teams in Spain do, and and they're vocal about it. And uh, I think everyone else doesn't want to go there per se. Look, I mean, I, I think these the leagues are not immune from the evolution that guys like us focus on with the teams. And so I think you know it's a huge opportunity, and you know, with the leagues uh, to evolve them as well. You know, parking capital in in the leagues. I you know I I, I don't know um, that that's that's not going to be a catalyst for evolving it. Um, but you know the, the 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 challenge for the leagues is that the teams, the individual teams, have become so valuable that it's almost like it's gotten away from the leagues, right? And I think there needs to be uh, people need to step back at the league level. And you know, if you think that these teams are mini Disney's. You know, look at the leagues and say, well, well, what are they? What's the relationship between the leagues and the teams? And you know, I, I think the the guys in the states, you know, they they they've done a pretty good job with that, right? But I, I would say, in general, globally, the leagues, the teams have gotten away from the leagues. And but I do think, you know, the super league question that you've asked does point out that there's there are things at the macro level that guys like us should be focusing on, and we can be helpful if we can engage with the leagues and look at them like companies as well. Um, that Usually that doesn't happen because when you get to the league level, it tends to all be about politics. But I think there's a missed opportunity there. Ian, final word. Well, uh, look, these guys handled the super, super league question. For, my, my final word would be, this is awesome. Like, it, it's so cool to look at a room of people, half of them you, you only knew through Zoom and see them in person. I don't know how many conferences I've been to, they serve hard liquor, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Somebody earlier told me I look like a fat Chuck Liddell. That hurt pretty bad. So I'm going to think about that a little bit. But it's just great to be here and be with everybody, right? So that's my final words. Thank well, you. Thank you.